Hey everybody, it's Evan Grant from the Dallas Morning News and DallasNews.com. Your friendly neighborhood Texas Rangers insider, mostly grumpy, occasionally friendly, um, always hungry. Here with another edition of This Week in Rangers Baseball, y'all. Uh, before we get started, let's just go through the big drill here. Remember, like our videos, thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the button on YouTube, uh, and uh, leave all your comments. I do read them. Even if I can't respond to them, I do read them depending on the week. It's, it just depends on what the workload is on, on how much I can interact on that front. Uh, we got a lot to get to today um, since I'm recording this uh, on the day after the Rangers blew a save to, of all teams, the Athletics of the Northern California, Greater Nevada area. Uh, so we'll get to the bullpen. I want to talk a little bit about pitching injuries. Um, don't worry. No, no additional pitching injuries for the Rangers to report, just on the topic in general. Um, talk a little bit about surprises. Um, may talk a little bit about disappointments, and we'll talk about what to do as Nathaniel Lowe inches closer to returning from the IL and Jared Walsh is playing first base. So let's get started. Let's talk bullpen. Uh, in Evan Help Us this week, which you can find on the website, and I think the link will be available here uh, as well. Uh, a lot of questions about the bullpen. And of course, there would be. The bullpen was this the Rangers' biggest uh, weakness last year. Club spent mm, about $10 million, give or take a million in, in deferred money, uh, to upgrade the bullpen over the winter with the signings of David Robertson and Kirby Yates. Uh, a lot of people here uh, and fans in general um, thought the, the Rangers should have done more. Um, and the bullpen is off to a little bit of a rocky start. There have been some good pieces. We just mentioned Kirby Yates and David Robertson. They've, they've pretty much done a great job. Robertson allowed his first run uh, as a Ranger on Wednesday, on Tuesday night, a game tying homer, which was one of the two blown saves in that game. Uh, Yates has allowed, I believe it's one base runner in four innings to at this point in time as we record this. But if you look at the overall bullpen, um, Jose Leclerc blew a save. Uh, he's now one of two this year in save opportunities. The Rangers are one of three with two of the blown saves coming in the Tuesday night loss to Oakland. Uh, if you go back to the start of 2023, the Rangers are 31 for 66 in save opportunities, which is just mind blowing. Uh, you look at how Bruce Bochy managed the bullpen in the postseason last year. What an asset it was. You look at his history uh, as a manager, what an asset he has turned his bullpens into. The Rangers' bullpen simply has not functioned that well for him at the end of games. Uh, on top of that, yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Jose Leclerc, but Josh Spores is currently injured. The Rangers feel that the, uh, that the shoulder strain he's got is not significant, and it should only keep him out the minimum 15 days. Brock Burke has been ineffective, and that is an increasing concern. So there are there are reasons beyond just the blown save uh, or the two blown saves on Tuesday night to be concerned. Uh, but there, I think, are also some reasons for, for this club to be more optimistic than it was at this point in time last year. And the question, of course, was asked to Bruce Bochy after the 4-3 loss to Oakland in which Shea Langoliers uh, hit three homers, the last of which was a two-run homer on a fastball at the top of the strike zone, poorly located, uh, poorly executed by Leclerc. Um, and the question was asked of, of Bruce Bochy, are you, what do you do at the back of the bullpen? And, and Bochy said, listen, it's, we're 10 games into the season, barely over a week. Uh, a little bit too early to be concerned. I don't know if it's too early to be concerned. I do think it's too early to panic. Because if you do take Jose Leclerc out of that role, especially with Josh Spores out right now and 
probably having to do something with Brock Burke in terms of lowering leverage for him. All of a sudden now you've got, you're, you're scrambling to fill a lot of key roles at the back of this bullpen. Uh, that would represent panic. Uh, it's what the Rangers had to do all last year. And I, I think it, it played a role in how inconsistent the bullpen was. Leclerc had a better spring training than he did a year ago. His fastball is better in terms of velocity than it was at this point in time a year ago. His his pitches are moving a little bit more than they did uh, at this point last year. And that's part of the problem because he's having to try and adjust uh, to get his, to get pitches into or the, on the edges of the strike zone and make them make the pitches he wants to throw out of the zone look like strikes before they get out of the zone and make the pitches he wants to throw in the zone uh, start in a place where they can land in the zone. Uh, so if Bruce Bochy were to take Jose Leclerc out of the closers role, it wouldn't be just as easy as say swapping him and David Robertson. If, if you take Leclerc out of the closers role, even for a couple of weeks, all of a sudden you've got to move him into a real low leverage environment to take pressure off of him uh, and to breed success. Or you've got to find an, an injury for him and put him on the IL. That just creates more holes. You know, you you saw Robertson give up a game tying home run on, on Thursday. He's got the most closing experience, uh, but his fastball isn't overwhelming at this point in time. Not that it ever was. Uh, but if you move Robertson into the ninth inning and then you move Yates, uh, well, you could probably keep Yates in the eighth. The, the Rangers have used Robertson twice in the eighth, Yates three times. So they, they've kind of split that. But let's say you you keep Yates there. Now, all of a sudden, what do you do for a left-hander? Uh, that probably becomes Jacob Latz for the time being ahead of Brock Burke. Uh, what do you do for the seventh inning? Are you going to put Jose Leclerc in the seventh inning? Or are you going to try somebody else there? Um do you took take Jose Urania, who has been one of the the biggest pleasant surprises of the early part of the year, and put him in a seventh inning role, which takes him out of a long relief role? So if you get to a point where you make a change at closer, you are having to move a lot of pieces around, and that can impact other success in the bullpen. Uh, the best possible situation here is for Leclerc to kind of work through these early season stumbles, know that the arm is in better shape than it was a year ago and uh, try and, and navigate that. If you can't, then you have to start making changes. But let's remember the Rangers didn't really make changes in the bullpen um, until the end of April last year. They had, they didn't really have defined roles early in the season, uh, but they didn't make big, big changes. The other part that I think is less less concerning for the Rangers this year than it was a year ago is I feel like there are there are more options for potential plug-ins if you need to. Uh, Grant Anderson did have a little bit of a rough time um, against Houston, but he was real sharp his first time out. Uh, he's a legitimate reliever. Mark Church and Antoine Kelly, a le the, the latter being a left-hander, are both in the minor leagues, and both of them are legitimate um, relief opportunity uh, re relief options. You go beyond that, then there's a couple of veterans down there, uh, in particularly in Austin Pruitt, who is really highly thought of inside this organization, uh, and so there are just more more options if the Rangers need to get to a point where they decide we've got to make a change. But I think in the short term, in 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 the in the short sample size of of ten or eleven games, uh, I think you want to try and get these guys through this. Look, Josh Hader, who I think a lot of Ranger fans wanted this club to go out and sign, has struggled out of the gate for Houston. Uh, yeah, the Astros bullpen in general has really struggled, and 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 it was thought to be a deeper, um, more talented bullpen. Uh, I think at the beginning of the season, especially with relievers uh, who only get six, eight innings and, and and oftentimes not in a real high leverage, real leverage situation in spring training, oftentimes pitching on backfields, um, 
a lot of times pitching earlier in games so they can face major major league hitters. I think there's just a little bit more unpredictability in April with with relievers. On the other hand, if the Rangers do feel like this is a long-term issue, they do get there. Look, there may well be a, a, a an enticing closer on the market. I, I think those of you who have, of you who have followed uh, me or or this um, this video cast know that. I think Edwin Diaz presents a, a really attractive option for the Rangers if if um, they're willing to go dive into their minor league system at some point in time. Mets are off to a rough start. Diaz is healthy. Uh, he's as good a closer as there is in the game. We could all use a little bit more trumpet music in the ballpark. But I think that's a long way down the road. I think this club is going to try and navigate the um, – the first stretch of the season. Try and get LeClerc back on track. Try and get everybody settled into situations. Uh, and then if you get to June, July, like this team did last year, you, you go out and you potentially address the situation. But I guess it's also important for me to remind you, there's a cost involved in that. Remember, the Rangers went out and got the best reliever on the market last June, or Aldis Chapman. And he was great for three or four weeks or a month and really saved this bullpen for a while. Also cost them Cole Reagans, who's lighting it up in Kansas City. So um, these are all things that Chris Young is going to have to consider if the bullpen remains an issue for the Rangers. I think it's always easy to transition from bullpen talk into injury talk. And so let's talk a little bit about that. There's been a number of pitchers this year who have already gone down with injuries. Uh, Spencer Strider, Yuri Perez, uh, Garrett Cole is out for at least 60 days. Um, there are, as often happens early in the year, lots of questions about injuries. And Major League Baseball and the Players Association, who never miss an opportunity to squabble, um, certainly seem to be exchanging um, blame for for the number of injuries this year. And I'm not sure that the pitching injuries uh, are any more, that there is an increase in the number of pitching injuries. I think there is uh, certainly more attention because of the number of high-profile pitchers that have been lost to uh, elbow surgery. Um, the Players Association has blamed the reduction, the, the pitch clock and the reduction, the further reduction in time that uh, pitchers have uh, between pitches with runners on base um, to 18 seconds um, or without runners on base, I'm sorry, to 18 seconds. That is, uh, has been their, their source of blame. I'm not sure I buy that as a standalone reason for why there are for blaming injuries. Major League Baseball has talked about trying to increase, improve tackiness and, and the, uh, the the stickiness of baseballs um, for their pitchers. I think this is this is a situation that that should have been and could be addressed rather quickly. Certainly the baseballs in Japan have an, a tackiness uh, layer already applied to it doesn't really require pitchers to um, uh, to improvise. And I think this could be th this could be regulated a little bit more. Um, but listen, there are it, it's impossible to take any issue and there are a number of issues around pitching right now and singularly blame them for an uptick in injuries. I, I mean, I've just listed a handful here. You know, you start with pitchers throwing harder at an earlier age and throwing more often. I think that leads to a number of juvenile um, elbow injuries, applying a lot more pressure to 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 the to the elbow while that ligament is still growing and not fully mature. Um, I think you look all over the web now and you look at teams and you look at 
you look at the entire industry and there's a there's a whole level of pitching gurus and biomechanics labs designed to enhance the maximum efficiency of pitches. I do not know what I don't know is how biomechanics labs um, are looking to incorporate maximum levels of protection for pitchers. Uh, you throw 99 or 100 miles an hour, that's great. But if you do it for a year and then you're going to miss two, uh, w what are we doing? Is is are, are pitchers that replaceable? Or should we be looking to try and protect the pitchers a little bit more, even if that means some 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 amount of a reduction in velocity? Uh, I think the other thing, and to listen to Keith Meister, the the Rangers doctor uh, director of medical services, and the leader in in elbow surgery repair, and a guy who has perhaps issued the or, or created the biggest revolutionizing element in in elbow surgery over the last twenty years by doing what he calls a hybrid procedure. We wrote about this in which he does both the traditional Tommy John repair and creates what is called an internal brace with an artificial ligament uh, to reinforce that Tommy John. And he's had good success with it. It's only a procedure he's been doing for about five years though. And so, you know, the sample size and understanding the life expectancy of this, this repair I don't know that we've got enough data on it yet to say, okay, this is the way we need to go with every operation uh, and, and whether or not it will it will provide better long-term protection for pitchers. Um, but Meister mentioned, Dr. Meister mentions pitch design as a real issue for him. And that goes back to the bio, that, that overlaps with the biomechanics labs. Um, he talks about when pitchers have to pronate or supinate uh, pitches and the and the grip that they put on pitches to increase that spin, um, really applying pressure um, in your forearm up through your elbow. Uh, when I visited with Dr. Meister in January and we worked on a story on on how he's changed Tommy John, he took a baseball and he he showed me some grips and he he showed exactly like asked me to to grip the baseball in the same way and and, and showed just how much more pressure you have to apply. Uh, to really execute that that breaking ball, that sweeping slider, those pitches that move more horizontally, and his his theory is that that just creates more stress on the elbow ligament. I just think that it's as I as I've said already here, I think it's impossible for baseball to look for one singular element of blame. And I, I find the pitch clock element probably for me the least likely to have impact. I don't know. Maybe the pitch clock in general going down to 20 seconds, not so much 20 to 18 seconds, but going to 20 seconds initially, maybe that did create some element of uh, not being able to recover for the muscle to recover between pitches. I think that there are other more dramatic issues that we outlined here uh, for, for reasons that, that, that elbows are, are breaking uh, at the level at which they are. And, and I'd, I'd encourage baseball and the players association. And I think everybody would, would do the same to get on the same page here. Stop arguing so much about what's to blame and figure out ways to protect the pitcher um, long-term. All right, enough medical talk because I've probably put my foot in my mouth. Let's talk about a couple of pleasant surprises for the Rangers in this first 10 days of the season. I think you really got to start uh, on that with, with Josh Smith, you know, especially since the Rangers are without Josh Young and at, at third base right now. And Josh Smith has, has filled in there um, against right-handed pitchers. He has moved off the plate a little bit. And look, if you've watched Josh Smith over the last few years, you know that the guy has a has a um, has an ability to get hit, not an ability, but has a knack for getting hit by baseballs. 
he's backed off the plate just a little bit. And I think that's allowed him to get to some inside pitches because what we're seeing is we're, we're seeing an increase in exit velocity. Uh, I know again, it's a small sample size, but the average exit velocity is 90.5 miles an hour right now. Uh, it was 88.5 for all of 2023, 87 miles an hour for 2022. Uh, so I, I, I think I think backing off the plate along with some swing changes have, have had an impact. And then when I look at his expected batting average, and take what you want of the advanced metrics, but I think that the uh, his XBA of 373 suggests that he is he's hitting the ball hard, that he's he's not getting lucky on pitches. He's he's hitting the ball hard. So it, it, it's been a very pleasant surprise because quite frankly, I thought that going to spring training. Josh Smith was not a lock to make this roster. I thought that with the Rangers having two backup middle infielders and with what they thought was a, a an, an infield that was going to play every day, I thought they might have gotten by with just one middle infielder uh, as a backup. But they carried two, um, proved to be a smart decision, and I, I, Josh is just off to a really good start. Uh, number two on my list of, of pleasant surprises is Cody Bradford. And here's a guy who is not a max effort pitcher. He's not a high velocity guy. What he is is a strike thrower. He moves the ball around. He gets the ball down in the strike zone. He pitches the contact. Uh, listen, I think that all spring, the conversation went like, okay, Cody Bradford's the number five Ranger starter until they get somebody else. And then they went out and signed Michael Lorenzen, and it appeared that Michael Lorenzen might start the season as the number five starter. Uh, but Bradford's had two really good starts out of the gate. He's looked very sharp. He's very studious. I think that he, uh, he's he got a real grasp, a graps, grasp of what he wants to do as a pitcher. And... We're seeing a guy grow into the role. I think part of the Rangers' decision to say, hey, we're going to let Michael Lorenzen work on rehab a little bit longer is they're not in a race to to move Cody Bradford out of the rotation right now. He's been he's been good the first couple of times through the order, uh, or the first couple of times through the rotation. And I, I do think we're seeing a pitcher who is who's willing to throw third pitches beyond the, the fastball and the changeup to try and find a way to navigate through uh, the third time through the order in, in games. So hats off to Cody Bradford at this point. Uh, number three on my list is, is probably Jose Urania, who made the team because this club needed long relievers. Uh, he's pitched four times in the first 11 games, seven innings worth. He's got seven and a third innings, which is as many as John Gray has in his two starts total. One inning less than Andrew Heaney has in his two starts. Urania, has, is, he's not allowed an earned run. Um, he's just allowed four base runners. He's thrown strikes. Uh, it's been It's been very, very promising. I think the Rangers see value for him in that role, particularly with the number of guys in, in, in this rotation that they feel are probably two trip through the order pitchers. But uh, Urania has been promising and uh, looks like a good find early on. Problem there would be, you know, four outings in 11 games is a lot for a long reliever. And you, you worry about at what point in time do you – do you fatigue him? Do you uh, potentially wear him out? So the Rangers have to be careful with that. And the last topic for you today, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Jared Walsh and, and Nathaniel Lowe. Nathaniel Lowe is probably going to go out on a rehab assignment, which will be a longish rehab assignment uh, over the weekend when the Rangers go to Houston. And I've had a lot of questions about what happens to Walsh when Lowe gets back. Well, Listen, Nathaniel Lowe is probably not back for another 10 days, two weeks, maybe even longer than that. That is, I hate to say it, it's a it's a lifetime in baseball. So to predict uh, what the Rangers would do if both those guys are healthy and ready to go is kind of impossible. But Jared Walsh is, is hitting 300 with an 800-plus on OPS at this point in time. He's off to a good start offensively. 
Yes, having two left-handed hitting first basemen who basically would play only first base or DH might be a little bit of an issue for this club um, and not an ideal situation. But I do think that that if Lowe and Walsh are both ready to play, I think the Rangers will find a way to to keep them both on the roster and and navigate that at least for 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 some period of time. Uh, there are other things the Rangers could do in terms of of potentially making a, a, a roster move. Josh Young isn't going to be back until probably early June. Uh, so without him, maybe you go to a situation where you are w- once Walsh is or once Lowe is ready, maybe you do platoon Duran and Smith at third base. Uh, the other one becomes your backup infielder, and maybe you don't need Davis Wenzel at that point in time. The 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 issue would be how do you get enough at bats for for two left handed hitters who both play the same position, and that that's something the Rangers are going to have to work through. Uh, it certainly gives them a left handed DH option uh, for days when they're facing right handed pitching, as opposed to maybe starting Leody Tavares. Uh, from the left-hand side against right-handed pitching, Rangers could move Evan Carter to center. Wyatt Langford could play left, uh, and uh, or sit, and Tavares could play center. Um, and then you could have both Walsh and and Lowe in the lineup. In other words, I think there's a lot of ways the Rangers could tackle this. I think if the worst problem the Rangers have is how do we handle two legitimate for left-handed hitting first basemen? It's it, these are the kinds of problems that this club would love to uh, entertain this year. So that's it from here. Uh, I know that um, my little backlight has on occasionally scooted into my eyes. How about that look? Um, it's kind of like looking into the eclipse right now because the, the little circle light is got a ring and then there's darkness in the middle of it. Um, but that's kind of like me. I'm a little bit light, light on the outside and a little bit dark in in here. A lot of darkness in, inside of me. Um, part of darkness, as they, they say. But anyway, I've prattled on long enough. Uh, it's great talking with you guys. Hopefully you'll be back next week uh, for more for more talk. In the meantime, remember, like the videos, comment on the videos, subscribe to the videos. Uh, And always, thanks for reading and watching. So long, everybody. This is good video.